Let's turn our attention back to Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Can we put that first one up there? Catapult Ministries may not be a household name if you're part of the clergy and you're a church worker, you're familiar with uh, the ministry of Catapult Ministries. They're a group of God-fearing, Christ-confessing people who want to catapult the church forward, move it forward in dramatic and significant ways. One of the things they do is they regularly, routinely survey Christians to see what's the climate of the church, what's going on, how are we doing? Uh, and every once in a while, I have uh, the honor, the privilege of participating in one of those surveys. And about three months ago, I did. And this week, we got the results back uh, of what that survey told us. They surveyed over 3,000 Christians. Uh, 3,100 and something. So over 3,000 of us were surveyed. As a result, they wanted to know, how have you been doing over the last 18 months? Since the COVID pandemic struck and we went through a tumultuous election and we now uh, have uh, deeply divided political opinions, uh, we, we have all kinds of racial tension in our country, now we have inflation uh, rearing its ugly head and we're just watching prices go up and go up and go up and all of this, how you doing? And one of the things we found is that 30% of everybody who filled out that survey 30% said that their mental health has declined in the last 18 months. They experience a greater sense of depression and discouragement and defeat. 37% of the respondents said they've actually watched their physical health decline. And that's not all related to COVID, although certainly that's a part of it. Uh, they seem to have more colds, and they seem to have uh, more uh, just feelings, days, I just don't feel good, I just don't have any energy, uh, I'm just not doing well today. 38% said that their emotional health had declined. They're a little quicker on the anger trigger, they get irritated and and frustrated just a little bit faster. Their ability to cope uh, and to get through and to look beyond seems a little bit frazzled and, and, and frayed on the ends. And so clearly these are difficult and tough times. And, and without having to identify any in particular, anybody else, uh, would you kind of agree that maybe that's not a bad snapshot of your life over the last 18 months? Kind of tough times for some of us. So if that's the case, if, if, if we're all kind of struggling, if we're all kind of just getting through, if, if we're watching our, our tempers flare a little bit faster, our patience dwindle a little bit more, uh, this is the time for Danny to get into the pulpit and talk to the people of God about stewardship. Uh, this is the time to say, let's talk about uh, your time and your talent and your treasure. And come on, you're all sitting there going, really? Now? But let's think about that for a second. The why of stewardship. And, and let's go back to the psalm, Psalm 116. One out of every three people is reporting that their physical health has declined. The psalmist said, the cords of death entangled me, and the anguish of the grave came over me. I thought I was going to die. I got right there to the precipice of the grave. Uh, my, my physical health deteriorated to the point where I wasn't sure I was going to make it. I, I wasn't sure I was going to live another day. The psalmist says, I was overcome. I was overwhelmed by distress and sorrow. I felt defeated and discouraged. I couldn't muster up the strength to get through the day. The littlest things irritated me and bothered me, and that's emotional health. The psalmist says, I was brought low. The word means to be depressed, to be pressed down, and that's mental health. 
And so the psalmist who wrote Psalm 116 knew some tough times, just like you and me, knew some stressful times, just like you and me, knew some difficult, ugly, dark moments, just like you and me. Physical, emotional, mental, all overwhelmed and all in decline. But he doesn't focus on that. That's not what he's going to think about day after day after day after day. It's not why he wrote this psalm. This is not a Facebook post. You know those Facebook posts where people say, having a really bad day, pray for me. And you, you just feel like you've got to answer, what's going on? It's an obvious cry for help. But why didn't you just tell me what was going on? No, we kind of mask it and we cloak it, but it's still there. It's kind of passive aggressive. Here I am, everybody, I'm really hurting. And people get there when they feel alone and like nobody cares and nobody's there. But that's not what this psalm is. It's, it's not one of those social media cries for help. Because the psalmist says, he heard my cry for mercy and he turned his ear to me. He reminds us, he saved me. And he reminds his soul, the Lord has been good to you. So in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of political crisis, in the middle of rising prices, in the middle of all that is going on, what are you thinking about? Are you reminding your soul that the Lord has been good to you? The Lord has blessed you in so many ways. You are still here. You are still surrounded by people who know you, love you, and care about you. Jesus Christ is still Lord and Savior. Your redemption and salvation are insured and guaranteed in his resurrection. And no one and no thing can take that from you. No circumstance, no bad day, no illness, no economy, no depression, no discouragement, no frustration can take that from you. God loves you in this moment. God is with you in this moment. The psalmist wants to remember those things and to remember when he went through those tough things and those difficult things and those stressful moments, he didn't go alone. And every time he cried out, there was a God who heard and listened, rescued and delivered him. And a God who was always attentive and always there. And the God who made a difference, he saved me. And then and only then, as he's thinking about this wonderful God, who even in the dark moments of life, the tough moments, the stressful moments of life, is my God, who knows me and loves me and walks with me and lives within me, my God. Then he turns his attention Not to just worship, not to just praise, but to stewardship. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will pay my vows. I will honor my commitments. I will respond to my God. There is no better moment for us to talk about stewardship than now. There's no more telling moment for us to respond to God than now, in the tough times, in the difficult times. Because we remember that even here and even now, there is a loving, caring, all-powerful God who has rescued us, called us to be his own, and will return for us. Put that next one up there. Why? The why of stewardship. God gave his only begotten son. Why? What did the Bible say? Why did he do that? What's it say? He loved the world. Now do a little Bible study and read through the Gospel of John and see how John uses that phrase, the world. It's very interesting that John didn't write, God so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son. That's not what he said. He didn't say God so loved us the Jews, the people of God, his chosen ones, the sons and daughters of Abraham. It's not what he says. God so loved the world. If you do a word study, 
in the Gospel of John, John consistently uses the phrase the world to refer to those who will reject Jesus and want nothing to do with him. The world hates you because the world first hated me, he said. You are in and among the world, but you are not part of the world. Don't join with them. Even those who would have nothing to do with him, who would reject his son, who would reject the gift, who would refuse the salvation, God still loved even them. God's love reaches out to everybody, whether they care or not, whether they respond or not. Whether they believe or not, he loves them and sent his son into this world for them. Christ gave himself up for me, Paul wrote in the Galatians. Me, me, Paul says. You remember me, the guy that was present, stirring up the crowd, passing out the stones that day we killed Stephen? The guy that's the motivation and the inspiration behind the murder of one of the deacons in the church. You remember me, don't you? Remember how I went to the political authorities in Jerusalem and I got all the paperwork I needed to travel to Damascus so I could arrest and bring back to Jerusalem all these heretics who believed in this Jesus of Nazareth and have them put to death as well. He he died for me. Why did he do that? Because he loved me. So who are you? And what have you done? And what have you left undone? What have you failed to do? But Christ died and gave himself up for you. Because he loved you. We know why God does what God does. Why do we do what we do? Why don't we do what we don't do? Interesting statistic I found getting ready for this sermon. In today's world, the average Christian family gives 2.5% of its income to the church annually. $2.50 for every $100 of income. But you know, during the Great Depression, people gave 3.3%. When people had less, they gave even more. Some of us don't remember the Depression. I wasn't alive in the Depression. My mom and dad were. The Depression got so deep and so bad for my mom's family that they had to move down to southern Illinois, and for a while, my grandpa and my grandma and my mom and her sister and her brother lived in a chicken coop. And the boards in that coop didn't meet. There were gaps uh, in between the boards, and my mom used to tell us stories when I was growing up. She'd wake up in the winter, and there'd be snow on top of the quilt because it had snowed in the chicken coop overnight. But there were people who didn't even have a chicken coop. There were refugee camps all across this country. People who had lost everything. But they responded and they returned to the Lord at a deeper level than we do today. What's that tell us about love? What's that tell us about why we do what we do? Let's, let's put that next one up there. Why, why talk about stewardship now? Really, Danny? Come on. <laughs> These are tough times. We're all just trying to get through. We're just all waiting for that better day to come. We're just all waiting for this to finally be over. Why now? Well, maybe we ought to remember that stewardship means you manage or you look after someone else's property. It's really not yours. Some of us are parents. How many of us have had the privilege of raising children or doing that now? Praise the Lord, right? Now, you know, we're not all perfect. I know you all did a better job than I did, and praise the Lord for that. Uh, But 
You know, I, I would have some uh, frustrating moments, especially when my kids were teenagers. Uh, I know that most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and we'd get into those, you know, difficult moments, and, and you know, they, they'd want something from me. Uh, you know, maybe they'd want money from me, and, and I would say, you know, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it? You know, and they would get real tight-lipped, or they'd get real vague, and I wanted some specific answers, what they were going to do. And then out of my mouth would come biblical heresy. <laughs> See, because I would say things like, this is my money. I earned it. Am I the only one that ever said anything like that? I guess I am. Not my money. I'm just a steward. Everything belongs to God. And someday he's going to say, Danny, I gave this to you. What'd you do with it? How'd you use it? How did it glorify my name? How did it expand my kingdom? How did it share my love? I think today stewardship obviously is about money but i don't think that money is the toughest part of stewardship today i think time is the toughest part of stewardship our lives are just too busy and our calendars are just too full and yet the psalmist says my times are in your hands it's not my time that's not my calendar it's not my schedule it belongs to god Jesus reminded us in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, which one of you can add a single day to your life? Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, what, what actions are you going to take so that you live one day longer than I have prescribed for you? Nothing. But if God gave you time and asked you to be a good steward of that time, what are you doing with it? How are you investing it? How are you spending it? Your time and your talents. Talents are used to make money, to advance careers, to pass classes, to pursue hobbies. Are they used for God? In, you know, a few minutes, I'll try to make it a few. In a few minutes, we'll pray and we'll go to the Lord's Prayer and we'll pray to our Father who art in heaven, will give him praise and glory, hallowed be thy name. And then we're going to pray for the next two things. What are those next two things? Thy kingdom, thy will, really? Maybe we ought to leave those out. You're praying for the kingdom of God to come are you working for the kingdom of God to come? Are you sacrificing for the kingdom of God to come? Are you sharing, are you giving for the kingdom of God to come? Or is that somebody else's job or is that God's job? But you're praying in this petition that you be an instrument of God and help him bring his kingdom to more and more people. Maybe we just ought to mumble our way through that phrase. Thy will be done. Well, we are all pretty clear on what the Bible has to say about stewardship and giving. So maybe we ought to just kind of mumble our way through that one as well. Let's put the next one up there. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I lie on the bed and I was sick and I got sicker and I got sicker and I got sicker. My mom and dad came and they prayed and my mom cried. My wife begged God to spare my life. My children were afraid, worried. What would happen if I was gone? The psalmist said I was near death. But he saved me. And the psalmist says, I've, I've known anguish and distress. I, I, I've known all kinds of emotional turmoil. I've had some breakdowns. I've had some screaming matches. I've had some moments of rage. And I've had moments of deep sorrow and sadness. 
And in all of those moments, I did very little to bring honor to God, love to my family, or honor to myself. But he heard my voice. He heard my cry. And he answered me. And I've known depression and defeat and discouragement. And I've quit. And I've given up. And I quietly raged at heaven, no more, no more, no more. I was brought low. But the Lord was good to me. And he saved me. What are his benefits to you? What's he done in your life? What's he done for you? What is he doing for you now? What do you need him to do? And why do you count on him to do it? Why would you ask him to do it unless you know him and his heart? Unless he's been there for you in the past and so you believe he'll be there for you now. What are his benefits to you? The word that's translated render is the nice little Hebrew verb shuv. It means to return or to give back. What am I going to return to God? What am I going to give back to God for everything he's done for me? How might that affect my monetary giving? How might that affect my use of my time? How might that affect the use of my talents? Ah, that after he comes through this horrible, dark, ugly time in his life, his thoughts turn to giving back to God. Let's put the last one up there. The Living Bible translates this section of Psalm 119. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. <laughs> How many of you can pray that prayer? Whatever it is, God, you just tell me, I'm your man, I'll do it. Well, how about go sacrifice your son Isaac? Uh, can we start a little bit lower, God? I mean, can we, uh, smaller sacrifices first? How about you build a boat, it's going to take you about 120 years, and everybody's going to mock you and ridicule you and make fun of you, and they're going to be convinced you have lost your mind and then you're going to watch all of them die scream and fear and terror for you to help them to open that door to let them in you will not i'm going to throw you in a furnace so hot it just killed the people that opened the door you're going to burn. You're going to know pain that you can't describe. I'll throw you in that pit with those lions. They're hungry. They haven't eaten in a while. They know why you're there. They're going to eat you while you're alive. Scream all you want. Nobody's going to help you. Follow me, he said to a bunch of fishermen on the shore of the sea one day. And Mark tells us immediately, without hesitation, immediately they left everything. Just tell me what to do and I will do it, Lord. As long as I live, I'll wholeheartedly obey. Make me walk along the right paths, for I know how delightful they really are. Ah, here's the key. How do you do any of that? How in the world would you say in your prayers tonight, Lord, just tell me what to do and I will do it? How could you be so bold? 
I trust you. Abraham said, you said this is the son of promise. You said through this boy, my family will go forward. So if I kill him, you have to keep your promise and you have to raise him from the dead and you have to give him back to me. Hebrews 11. As horrific as it might be, Noah and his family will survive the flood. The men will live through the fiery furnace and Daniel will come out of the lion's den. And the disciples will realize everything they left meant nothing and everything they've gained means everything. I trust you. Could your stewardship change if you trusted the one who loves you more? Thinking about this sermon, and we'll talk a little bit more next week, I thought about the difference between reacting and responding. Uh, stewardship is a response ability. When you're a little kid and your parents tell you to do something, you react. Now that maybe makes a lot more sense to my generation. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. How many of us grew up in the 50s and 60s? Come on. I know we're all getting a little bit older. In, in our day, I don't know about your mom and dad, in my day, if my father told me to do something, and I just looked at him and said, hey, blow off, old man. Um, you know, there, there'd be a tombstone somewhere in Kankakee now with my name on it. You, you didn't, you, you couldn't. And if you didn't obey, there was going to be a penalty, and it was going to be painful. So you reacted. I don't want that penalty. I don't want that kind of discipline. I don't want that to happen to me. So if he said pick that up, I'm, I'm going to pick it up. That's not stewardship. Stewardship isn't, well, God will be angry if I don't do this. God will be upset with me if I don't do this. Or God will love me more if I do. Because his love for you is not based on what you do. It's not based on what you don't do. He loves you. As I grew up and I got older and I began to learn and grow and observe, I realized there was a time my dad worked three jobs, put food on the table. When he was able to whittle that down to one job, he still worked 10, 12 hours a day. And he'd come home after a 12-hour day and get his old baseball mitt and we'd go out in the backyard and we'd play catch. I knew he was tired, I could see it in his eyes. I knew he had to go put in another 12-hour day the next day. But out there we'd go and we'd toss the ball. I began to appreciate how much he loved me. How incredible that was. How it motivated everything he did. How it made decisions that he made. He loved his family, he loved his kids. I don't want to react to God. I want to respond. I want to give love back. When he says, Danny, I love you, I want to be able to say, Father, I love you too. But not just words. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, then do what I ask you to do. So I want to be able to say, I did my best, Father, to do what you asked me to do because I wanted you to know how much I loved you. In the midst of all that's going on in your life, it's time to remember how good God is and how much he loves. And that we have this moment in this place to love him back. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's not about guilt. 
not about shoulds or oughts or musts. It's about love. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to, to wipe away all those shoulds and oughts and musts and have-tos. I want you to erase all the thoughts in our heart that if I do this, God will love me more. If I do this, then God will answer my prayers. If I do this, then God will give me what I want. Help us just to see who you are. Help us to see your deep abiding love and how it guides and directs everything you do. And help us, Lord, to find ways in accordance with your will and your revealed word to love you back. In that word, you told us we could cry out to you. We could pray on behalf of those who are ill and sick and struggling. So we pray for everybody that's struggling with this pandemic. And we ask for your healing grace to rescue and to deliver and to heal. We want to pray specifically for Lee and Linda Boyer, sister and brother-in-law of Charlene, for Trent, for Elizabeth Cox, who's the mother of Beth Heimsoff, for Kurt Johnson, who's the uncle of Tammy Stegey, for Josh Schneezek, who's going to undergo heart surgery in a week. For all those, Lord, that are known to us in our hearts, we raise them before your throne in Jesus' name and ask for your healing grace. Give calm and strength, patience, and peace to their loved ones. We pray for all our veterans. We give you thanks and praise for their bravery, for their courage, for their strength, for their willingness to serve and to sacrifice. We thank you for the sacrifice that was offered by their families as they watched their loved ones go off and serve. For those who grieve and mourn this day because their loved ones did not come back home, but made the ultimate sacrifice on the altar of freedom. Give them the hope, the comfort of a blessed reunion in heaven through Jesus Christ. For those who serve us this day all over the world, Watch over them, bless them, and keep them safe. Help them to fulfill their duties and responsibilities, and when it is the appropriate time to return home safely to their loved ones. Give wisdom, discernment, knowledge to all those who serve in our government, from President Biden all the way down to our city councils. Help them all to know that which is right and true and best, and give them the courage and the strength to fight for it and to pursue it. Continue to guide us, Holy Spirit, as we seek to know your will for our ministry here at New Song. How do we best serve you? What is the path that you are laying out for us so that we share your love amongst ourselves and then into our community? These and all things, Lord, we bring before you in the words that your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.